really no. good. Good, okay. good. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tatiana Show, Florida edition. I am airing uh, to you, coming to you from Orlando in Florida. I'm here for the National Libertarian Party Convention and for a little bit of sun and relaxation in between copious amounts of blockchain work. I'm um, very happy to be here with you guys and to see my co-host, Josh Shigala, who I haven't seen in a couple weeks. Hey, Josh. How's it going? Hey, good, Tatiana. I'm down in Wien. I just spent uh, some time in Prague at the Bitcoin conference there. It was a really good conference. A lot of cool people. Amazing city. I don't know if anyone gets a chance to get down to Prague. It's 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 photogenic. As uh, it's probably the most photogenic city in the world. It's really amazing. And now I'm in Vienna, uh, Austria, for the Pioneers Festival. So it's 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 great and um, uh, yeah, very exciting. What so, is the Pioneers Festival? Uh, it's a festival of it's a startups festival. Uh, so we entered Voltoro.com, and uh, you know people are really interested in how how Bitcoin is and and gold mixed together. So they they uh, got us tickets uh, to go down there. So that, that was really really exciting. Yeah. Very cool. I've heard Vienna is quite lovely. Yeah, I've well, never been. Four hours. So I'll I'll get back to you on that. Um, I was in Prague last year with Lynn Ulbricht and we traveled from Prague to uh, Krakow and we also went to the city of Wrocław in Poland as well as Warsaw. Oh, wow. And I've been to Krakow and, Pol uh, and Prague at the same time twice already and both times I still vote Krakow. I know everybody loves Prague and maybe I'm partial because of my Polish roots but still, um, have you been to Krakow yet or no? No, but I've heard a lot of beautiful things about it too. I've, I've, you need a friend that's Polish. Yeah, named well, Tatiana to take you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's why we're friends. So get over here. And be let a the, proper tour guide. Yeah, um, let me say you know, fill you up, and then get over here. Wait, what? Oh, let the TSA feel. I thought you were like, let me feel you up and get over here. I'm like, this is a little inappropriate. But okay, I'm glad that we're keeping things on the on the level. Um, on the up and up. So I'm excited for our first guest today. Um, Neri Ruer is a rock star of Liberty and also um, wrote a book, Healing Our World. Um, and I thought that that was really interesting. I had heard her on a podcast that Tom Woods did with her about the FDA. I have another one queued up, actually, um, that talks about, I believe, the war on terror. But I'm not really sure what we're going to talk about today. Uh, not all of our listeners are familiar. So I think this is a great opportunity um, to introduce them to Mary Rurt. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes. And we also met in... Um, in Texas for the San Antonio San Antonio Libertarian Party Convention. Are you coming down to Orlando this week? No, I'm not. Wow, <laughs> I have some personal so to stay home. Well, yes, fortunately. So what do you think is going to happen with this election? I mean, the, the LP is heating up. There's a lot of... I, I can't believe it. There's people voting for Austin Peterson. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I think Austin Peterson is doing a very, very good job. Um... I think everybody's doing a really good job. Um, do you have a horse in the race or any thoughts on the, the high-level stakes going on this year? Well, I like a lot of, I mean, just about every candidate has something I really like and mm -hmm. something I don't like. So I don't have a true favorite. I suspect that unless he really uh, says something untoward that Gary Johnson will get the nomination. But you never can tell. These conventions have a lot of surprises. Huh, I don't know. I don't know who's going to win. I'm, I'm, I'm going with, uh, I really like the McAfee uh, videos that Judd Weiss has been putting together. Have you seen those? Uh, no, I haven't, but I have seen McAfee speak, and uh, he's a great speaker. One of the things I like about him is I think he actually presents the message very well. Mm. He's a good speaker. Uh, that's one of the things I really enjoy about him. Plus, he has life experiences that make entertaining stories, so I do appreciate that. Well, you know, I think McAfee's very exciting, right? Um, Gary is great, but Gary is, I don't know, I, I guess he's not as a, as in touch like with, with some of the things that John McAfee seems to be tapping into. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I like the idea that, that John McAfee's campaign is about conveying ideas. And, I mean, maybe they think they'll win, maybe they think they won't win, I don't know. I don't think anybody in the Libertarian Party is going to win, unfortunately. I just don't think that the system is even, 
um, accepting real applicants. I think this is a closed system with just a little bit of theater in the front. But uh, but I like the idea of winning with ideas. And, and a lot of different anarchist friends of mine that became completely disillusioned in 2012 are now back in the scene. We're all looking at each other. How are we at another presidential election? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're wondering how we got here. Um, do you, what are your thoughts on, on the presidency and, and about the Libertarian Party in general being able to win and, and the impact that it can have? Well, well I think they, technically we could win this year if it was real and if we could rally. But like technically, this is a good year to go. Uh, well, I think we're going to get more play this year than we ever have, simply because the uh, apparent choices of the GOP and the Democratic Party are so, uh, let's say, uh, so disliked. <laughs> <laughs> You're so much but, more polite than me. <laughs> but, you know, I think actually our real strength is not being played to, and I want to talk about that because I actually think that we can change things without electing anybody. You know, when I was back running even even in the um, you know early 80s it became apparent very apparent that even though we didn't win elections when we went out there and spoke about our principles we got people very excited and afterwards after the election people would come to us when there was a problem for example in Kalamazoo where I was at the time uh, we were going to have a huge whopping bond issue to consolidate our rail lines and they were taking uh, the land for this by eminent domain and when the libertarians went to a meeting on this uh, someone came up to me and put two hundred dollars cash in my hand before he even spoke a word and he said Dr. Ruart I know your employer is going to really benefit by this eminent domain land grab but Dr. Ruart I know you're on my side because you you are a libertarian. So take this money and fight because they're going to take my bicycle shop away, the one that my brother and I built up all these years. And the libertarians joined that fight and we did stop it. And we didn't elect anyone. We basically rolled back big government without electing anyone. And that's what libertarians are exceptional at. We are more well organized than any other group normally in a city or a county or even a state in terms of fighting these issues that Democrats and Republicans just think should happen. You know, eminent domain, that's fine with them. Taxes, fine with them. You know, but we don't agree with that and neither do most people. And if we can be the people they come to when big government comes knocking at their door, we can make a huge difference. And we are, we just don't celebrate it. And that's too bad because as you said, <laughs> the system's rigged against us. I don't even know if the vote counting is legit. Um, when I was a campaign manager for a fellow in Kentucky who was running for sheriff, uh, he had several people come up to him and say, oh, we voted for you absentee. But you know, he only got one absentee ballot in the official count, so it kind of makes you suspicious. <laughs> and we've had other instances where there's actually been exit polls done on libertarian candidates who supposedly won uh, two to one, but when the official count came, they lost two to one. So you have to wonder if the vote counting is legit. But there's no real voting that goes on in some of these other issues. Um, you know, the, the issue can be won simply by pressure from the uh, people that are in a city or a county. And that's where we excel. And so that's where I would advise the Libertarian Party to focus its efforts. Yes, run candidates because it advertises us. And talk about our principles because that tells people where we stand on the issues. And of course if you can win, win. <laughs> but you know, let's let's roll back big government. Yeah, I saw uh, during the uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting uh, 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 yeah, I'm having trouble hearing you. You're cutting out. Yeah, uh, yeah. an echo. Have you heard it? Um, I I couldn't understand what you said. Okay. Um. Yeah, I was just saying that uh, I'm getting an echo from from. Mary, because you're not wearing a headset, we're getting an echo. So when you're not talking, if you could just hit the mute button, that'd be great. Yeah, I can do that. Thanks. Okay, so what I wanted to say, uh, that's what I noticed during the Robert 
Ron Paul campaign both times. Both time. uh, the both, both actually, I think he's yeah. really over his lifetime. But uh, what I noticed really it was the Libertarians never party in terms of party never really had a major chance of getting the presidency. But what they had was a platform to educate people on some of these topics and not just say, hey, look, um, there's another, you know, to say there's another answer than just bigger government, more taxes. The, uh, the, the other answer is X or Y and, and educating about economic theory, Austrian economic theory in, in, in particular, uh, in, in sound money and all these important topics that really never get mentioned uh, by the other parties. And I think people are ready to hear that. That's the beauty of it. They really are ready to hear it. They know things are wrong. They just don't know what is wrong. Mary, I have a question for you. When we were at the LP convention in San Antonio, you talked a lot about reaching out to the left and to the more compassionate side of people, which is I think a little bit overlooked. You know, we spoke about women's issues in um, in Libertarian Party, and Traditionally, it's, you know, let's face it, a sausage fest wherever we go. Um, and there's just all guys there and there's not that many women. But I think that there's a lot of um, reasons for women and just people, I guess, traditionally associated with being more compassionate, let's say the left, um, to find uh, hope within this party. So I, I do find it a little bit difficult. You know, I'm an artist. I want to try and reach out to people. Sometimes I find it very frustrating to deal with leftists because if you try and tell a Bernie person about how you know his policies would actually negatively impact the poor, there is nothing getting through. And it's very easy as a flawed individual to get frustrated and be like, you guys are idiots, I'm out of here. <laughs> Somebody bring me a cocktail. <laughs> but no, I, I don't think that that's actually um, the best approach. And it's something that I've really wanted to, to get a little bit better at. So do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I like to say things like poverty as we know it today wouldn't exist in a libertarian society because government creates most of the poverty that we have today. And of course that shocks people. So what do you mean? <laughs> okay, now you've got them talking. <laughs> and that's the important thing. So that's how I get that started. And actually I find liberals to be very receptive to that. It depends, of course, the kind of environment you have to work with. Um, I have found that when I talk about how liberty helps the poor and go through all of the ways in which government hurts the poor, that it has a big impact. Um, I had a liberal person come up to me after a talk that I gave when I was in my 30s. She was probably in her 60s. And she said, I realize that everything I've been all my life has done just the opposite of what I want to do. You know, she got it. And, you know, we, we, it was a very emotional moment. We both had tears in our eyes. And we hugged and I said, well, you've got the rest of your life to, you know, do it right. And, and she got all excited. And I think, I think one of the things we have to realize is that when we're telling liberals that what they're doing is harming the very people they're trying to help, that's, that's a very emotional moment. Well, we've got to be there to support them through that transition because, you know, that's that's an incredibly difficult thing to realize. Yeah, and, I, I noticed uh, just recently there was a, a major university been pushing for a higher minimum wage and uh, and it, it finally got put into law and the first thing the university did was fire a whole lot of people. <laughs> and so you see that they they have good intentions, you know. A lot of the left have great intentions. I I come from the left originally, uh, until I saw that that everything was just backed by force and violence, and and so it it takes a while. But it it really um shows that a lot of people really have good good intentions. They just feel they don't. Uh, I feel generally what happens is the first thing that you do is think, okay, they need to fix it. Not me. They they need to, and they need to pass a law, and they need to uh, point guns at people to uh, to to make this happen. Um, yeah. Well, and that's a whole another um, way to position this. Uh, a lot of, especially spiritually minded people, support liberal agenda, thinking that they're helping people, but they're very much against violence. And so when you start 
sharing with them exactly what happens when you don't pay your taxes and and go through the step-by-step -step process of saying well you know if I came to your door and put a gun to your head for my favorite charity you know would you consider that stealing and of course they would and then you go through and if I brought the majority of my neighbors with me would that change anything and if the majority of the neighbors hired someone to come to your door would that change anything you know the light bulb goes off and actually that recognition was the linchpin, I think, in in my acceptance of the non-aggression principle, because you know I wanted to help the poor, and I didn't like to see people being selfish. But when I realized it was less loving to put a gun to someone's head and take their money for the poor, <laughs> you know, I woke up. Yeah, and not only that, I, I see it very often where someone will, um, uh, 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 someone, a homeless person or someone will ask for some money, and and the person might give anything or whatever and I'll hear them say the government pays them plenty of money we we pay all our taxes gives them money and, and they always have this 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 hatred towards them because they've been they've already had money taken from them to serve these people and these people are still hungry and still suffering and and but they can't put two together they just get angry because well, how dare he ask for me for money because I've already paid him through this this uh, this circle uh, this, this uh, through the state, so it's it's yeah, it's it's interesting seeing. It creates an adversarial relationship between the poor and then the re regular people. There's no compassion, and it makes sense that there shouldn't be because you've already paid so much of your money in order to help them. Really, you're helping some guy line his pockets, but um. Yeah, I don't know. And then and then there's the other response of needing government to fix the very problem that they've created over and over again. I don't know what the quick answers are to to, to trick people or not trick them. <laughs> trick people sounds terrible. But to kind of like get them in uh, into the into the freedom mind set Educate. instead of the control. Educate. There you go. <laughs> See, that's what you're here for messaging. Well, one of the things that I have an advantage of is I worked with the poor for a long time. I rented to them, and I heard the stories, and I realized what was going on. And in the case of the homeless, especially, the government doesn't help the homeless. If you want a welfare check, you have to have an address. Guess who that eliminates? The people who need money the most. So who takes care of the homeless today? Well, you know, the people who are giving those coins on the street, the people in Texas who... Um, tried to give them a Christmas dinner or a Thanksgiving dinner and found out that the government wouldn't allow it. So this year they came armed to the Christmas dinner so they could feed the homeless. Now that's really... Armed like with guns? Yes, armed like with guns, yes. yes. So what was the purpose? So if the government well, came so to the try and fight well, them? Yes, because you know the police came to shut them down and thought maybe this isn't such a good idea. We'll let them give them this meal. Yeah, I know. It's against the law here, because <laughs> I'm in Texas now. It's against the law in many places to feed the homeless. Um, and I don't, uh, they have a variety of excuses, um, such as the food wasn't prepared in a properly inspected kitchen, <laughs> and things of this nature. And it's, it's very sad. It's very sad. But I mean, that's, when you have to be armed in order to feed the homeless, you know, that something isn't going down right. And when you're aware of stories like this, it's it makes it a lot easier, of course, to talk to people about the poor. So one of the things I encourage libertarians to do is, you know, recognize what's actually going on. And that's why Healing Our World had like a thousand references this time, because I was trying to help libertarians have the resources to point to where studies have been done and incidents have happened that really show them, you know, what is going on and how they can use these stories to help uh, really uh, people, especially liberals, understand how what they're proposing is going to do just the opposite of what they think it is. So you've written a book. Uh, is is what, what's the name of the book? It's called Healing Our World, The Compassion of Libertarianism. And, and you also have a second book, though, right? Yes, I have short answers to the tough questions, which are kind of sound bites for libertarians, because nobody wants to listen for four hours. So it's, it's I think that's the one I need. 
<laughs> well, it, it helps people say things that get their interest. Like earlier when I was talking about poverty being created by government today. Things like that get people's interest and then they allow you to talk a little more and so you keep on with that theme and it helps people because what we're saying is actually very, in many cases, not intuitively obvious. Fantastic. And that's available through uh, Amazon uh, and, and local bookstores as well, I'm guessing through the States. Are you getting many sales from overseas? Um, I get a fair number from overseas considering how expensive shipping is. I'm trying to get, um, I, have a, I do have a Kindle edition for short answers and I'm getting one for the new healing. Uh, Healing's now in its fourth edition. The fourth edition came out last year. Yeah. Do you have this as an audiobook? Um, I'm having an audiobook made of healing. There is already one for short answers um, and you can get it at audible.com. Very good, um, because I, I sometimes have a hard time sitting down and reading anything, but I think that this is exactly what I'm looking to, to do, right? I'm always thinking and, and trying to think of ways that I can be a little bit more succinct, and, uh, and that's great. So how did, you, how did you kind of fall into the libertarian mindset? Like, where did you come from? How, how did it happen? <laughs> well, I went to college, and of course, at that time, um, Ayn Rand was all the rage, so I read her books and had some friends that were really into her. And of course, they educated me in the areas in which I was deficient. <laughs> and I've been a libertarian ever since. You ran yeah. for president at one point, right? Yes, yes, I've run for president a couple different times. Uh, in '83, at my first national convention, I wanted to suggest that if we ran a woman at the top of our ticket, we would get more press. I didn't know that the media blacked us out at this at that time. I really was just trying to propose something. So I was told that the only way to get an idea across in a presidential convention was to run for president. So I did that thinking, I just want to get the idea across. And I was taken seriously. <laughs> and, you know, there was a big, um, <coughs> excuse me, a big tie between the two front runners. So it was interesting because I ended up with 20% of the votes. I got to see what happened at the top. And it was a little discouraging because I felt that we didn't necessarily uh, live our principles uh, when we were in that kind of position. It's a, it's a challenge ethically when you're running for president. A lot of things come up that really contest your, um, well, contest your resolve on a number of things. And uh, in some cases, the you know, we're all human. We we fail. Yeah, I, I agree with the cartoon. It's called uh, "If I Were King" or something, or "If You Were King" or something, and it really goes through like, ah, oh, so you think everything would be better if you were king, and you have all the answers, okay? So, and then it talks through what would happen. Well, say you want this, half the people are going to hate you because they don't want it, and then. And then you're going to have to pay for this because you don't actually have any money. So you're going to have to steal from from everyone, and most people will hate you for it. And then uh, you need guards to protect yourself, and then it sort of all all stems out to really this. So coming from a libertarian mindset, it's really hard to run for president because you do challenge all these things because they they fundamentally uh, this you know it, it's kind of like. Um, a, a good person try, uh, trying to get into the, the, the biker group and turning them into the United Way or something, it's, it's really a, a very hard thing to do is to change the system from the inside. I think it's, um, you know, and my resolve personally is to uh, build a better system and this is where Bitcoin and blockchain is really, uh, the blockchain's really helped uh, in my life is to say, you know what, uh, uh, this, this was the quote from Buckminster Fuller, he said, you, you can't fight the existing system. You can just make something better and make the old system obsolete. I'm, I'm not getting that quote exactly right, but it's it's something like that. And and really, that's where I see this massive step forward that we've seen with Bitcoin in terms of liberty, uh, in terms of uh, personal liberty and personal freedoms on one of the most fundamental parts of society, which is money creation or money in general, and who controls that money. It's something that uh, has been 
baffling people for many, many years because on purpose it never gets talked about or taught in schools. It's just, uh, well, you live and you get at work. I mean, even even people like Karl Marx, who, who wrote, uh, spent years writing you know, on economics, was obsessed with the boss-worker relationship. He didn't uh, even go one step further back and have a look at how money's created. And, and so hence he got a lot of stuff wrong. But, uh, and, and, and consequently, um, you know, uh, shocking, shocking countries with a lot of millions and millions of deaths. So, um, uh, it, it's, it, I guess I'm ranting here a bit, but uh, what I'm saying is that um, you know, personal freedom and person and Bitcoin especially has helped uh, me. And instead of trying to change and, and get more political active, I, I really uh, uh, taking steps in my own personal life to to deliver freedom to me and my family and my friends. I have an interjection. So I used to like uh, Dennis Kucinich, big fan, before I became uh, a Ron Paul lover. And, you know, some people think of Dennis Kucinich as the Ron Paul of the left. So if Dennis Kucinich and Ron Paul are friends and they know each other for a long time, why hasn't Dennis Kucinich become a libertarian? Like, does he not understand Austrian economics? Does he not agree with them? Why do people who know about this stuff continue to go down the path of liberalism? Why would they do that? I don't understand the mentality. Mary, do you have any insight into that or any guesses? Well, I guess it's probably different for each person. Uh, I think, there, as I said before, there's a reluctance to let go. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, but I'm having a little bit of a <laughs> frog in my throat today. I have had a frog in my throat for, for a long time. So we're fine. We're fine. <laughs> but um, I, I think there's also often a reluctance to let go of old beliefs. And especially when you find out about the ideas of liberty when you're older, it's even harder. So I, I think that that's a big factor. The other thing is, you know, if you think about it for a moment, it really means that government isn't your protector. It's your persecutor and it's like it's like we don't like to think that way because we want to think there's a protector out there it's just like the abused child or the abused spouse that doesn't want to believe that they're being abused they want to believe the other person really loves them their, their parent or their spouse so I think again there's a psychological resistance to believing that government is the quote bad guy and Do you and so I think that's a big biggie. Do you think that's why we have all these weird libertarians that for some reason are really into Bernie now? Because I find that phenomenon to be really surprising. The reversion back to, Daddy, help us! Daddy, help us! <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, Andre Maru, who was our presidential candidate back in the early 90s, uh, said that he, he felt that people voted for Bernie because he was such a nice guy. That was, his, that was his evaluation. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. I don't know Bernie personally. But um, I think what he was saying is that when people are voting for someone to make law, it's going to affect them. They want to think that the person doing that is a, quote, good person, a compassionate person. And because they feel instinctually that, that person will make the right decisions for them because they care. Now, that's not necessarily true, but it's understandable why they might think that. So you so think that the libertarians think that Bernie is a nice guy? I mean, granted, the options are pretty pathetic. Well, the thing is, a lot of our candidates are very knowledgeable, but they aren't very personable. And I think that's a turnoff. I mean, it's in, you know, <laughs> it's important, of course, when you're looking at who you're picking for president to know and be able to predict what they're going to do. And we can't do that normally. Now, as libertarians, we probably have an edge on that <laughs> because we know what kind of tools the Democrats and Republicans are going to use. So we already know that their choices are not the ones we're going to like. But yeah, most but people don't have that. I find the American uh, election system uh, is generally not really about politics anyway. It seems like a massive circus 
uh, a multi-billion dollar circus uh, that, that is really just a, another TV show. It's, an, it's another reality TV show. It's really uh, not about uh, actually talking about topics. You know, you, you see it when, when, when you have oil slicks in the Gulf of Mexico, you have multiple wars around the world. No one no one blinks an eye, but then when uh, transgender want to go to the toilet, it's all, ah, you know, and everyone freaks out. He's just thinking, everyone in Europe's thinking, what? You know, we, we have one toilet here for everyone. You know, <laughs> they don't even, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, phenomenal. it's phenomenal. And sometimes you just go, oh, really? Um, you know, and I, don't, I mean that in the best of ways because I've got a lot of very, very beautiful American friends. So it's nothing to do with, uh, American people, but really the, the, the electoral system is such a shit show. Wow. And maybe that's why Trump has done so well. You know, people perceive him as a movie star, so they vote for him. Definitely. Definitely. I see that a lot. That he's, he's a very charismatic, uh, lovable guy. I mean, uh, especially, uh, not, not lovable, but, uh, you know, a charismatic guy. But you see that as well with Obama. Um, he's also extremely charismatic, can talk amazingly, and very inspirational when he talks, you know, to a lot of people. And and so, uh, yeah, it, it's more, uh, it's more uh, anything over substance. <laughs> just... Well, I was uh, speaking with a friend the other day, and we were talking about the upcoming elections. And what she was saying was, is that Obama was our first celebrity president. He did the circuit of all the different shows, you know, the night live shows, whatever, all these kind of teeny bopper things before he even got into a real interview. So he won based on this amazing PR machine. Um, he said all the things that people wanted to hear, but he didn't do any of them. Um, I mean, he's, his presidency has been terrifying. But even now, people still think of him as this peace lover. And I'm like, what? Uh, the, and the love of him, and especially his prosecution of whistleblowers is appalling. I don't know how anybody could justify that. Um, and I yet people are just into, but he's Obama, he's cool. Yeah, you know, it's it, he plays basketball. So what? Hitler was nice to dogs. It doesn't mean that they're nice people. So yeah. I just, I, I find it very um, disturbing and I think it's, uh, goes, well, discouraging. But very much into what Mary was saying before about uh, what's called cognitive dissonance. When someone's put so much work into a belief system, then even when they're shown absolute proof that that belief system is wrong, they will, uh, instead, of, instead of recalculating their belief system, they'll get angry, they'll get uh, uh, defensive, extremely defensive, and sometimes it's quite scary sometimes. And um, and so that's that's uh, it's very hard to deal with uh, this concept of, of cognitive dissonance when <clears throat> when it's really finally ingrained in people that they they fought really hard for Obama they they cheered and when he won it was so great for everybody in fact the entire anti-war movement just dissipated overnight um, and 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 nothing really happened Guantanamo is still open but when you mention that. They, they get all, oh, Obama's fantastic, and, and that's the end of it, because this cognitive dissonance idea. Yeah, think about it. I mean, it'd be really horrible to believe in a president and then find out he goes and does everything the opposite that you wanted him to do. I mean, there's going to be a certain resistance to that. Although I have to say, I have met many people who have gotten that. You know, and they are not Obama supporters anymore, which is one of the reasons they're looking at libertarians. So... You know, there is hope there. And and I think what's happening is although there is a tendency for a lot of Americans to focus more on, shall we say, the trivial, uh, there also is, I find, in younger people, uh, certainly uh, an interest in getting to the bottom line, seeing what the truth really is. And, you know, I've been around in the movement since, well, you know, <laughs> the early 70s, basically. And I have never seen this before. By, by not seeing it, I mean, I've never seen the young people pick up so strongly as they did in my generation on this thirst for truth. So it's there. 
good things are happening. In fact, I was beginning to worry that it, like, when it came time for me to pass the baton, there wouldn't be anybody to pass it to. But now I'm all excited because I see so many wonderful young people out there, and they are the cream of the crop. In my generation, we were kind of the nerds, the oddballs. Uh, you had to be. Um, sometimes even the social misfits, because you had to be to adopt uh, an idea like libertarianism when you had no studies to fall back on. <laughs> we're all you, we're, we went out and talked about an end to the drug war and an end to the IRS back when it was just the most shocking idea that there could be. You know, people didn't, didn't say things like that. We were out there, the only ones saying it. Today, it's mainstream to talk about these things. So, from where I'm coming from, there's been a lot of progress, probably more than you can see. And I'm telling you that because I want you to get excited about where we are because we have made that progress. And things are starting to look different. So, you know, you know, yes, it's frustrating when some people don't get it, but more people are getting it than ever before. And the cream of the crop are getting it. So you've got you've got the very best. Well, I hope so. I saw a meme that said Ron Paul made teenagers believe in reading, you know, six two hundred year old text with six hundred pages, whereas Bernie has inspired people to make make up their mind about economics from memes. So I don't know. It's I think it could be a little discouraging, but but fingers crossed. I like I like your enthusiasm. Um, okay, okay, well, we're well, going to wrap, wrap it up right now, right now with Mary. Mary, um, Mary thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you could give us a plug for your website and people can find out where you are and everything, that'd be great. Sure. Well, my website is basically my last name, ruart.com, R-U-W-A-R-T.com. There's lots of free stuff on it. Um, of course, you can buy my books there, but you can also get excerpts of the books and actually read the 1993 version of Healing Our World free in my free library. So check it out and enjoy. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. I hope I see you again at another event. I wish you were going to be down with us here in Orlando. I would love to be, but it's not meant to be this year. <laughs> How about Freedom Fest? Are you going to be there? Uh, no, probably not. What? These I are terrible, terrible answers. I know, I know. Well, I have to finish my FDA book, so that's, uh, that's my priority right now. Well, I'm absolutely looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Mary. We appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you, and keep up the good work. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Well, that was, uh, that was amazing. It was great. You know, I, I, I agree that uh, the world is uh, really waking up. Young people are really waking up, and I think... Ron Paul really made a massive dent in the youth market. I mean, uh, uh, you know, a lot of uh, I really saw him uh, when his campaigns were going going up. Uh, really saw him. Uh, really saw a lot of young people waking up to the ideas um, that we talk about here. Um, yeah, I think it's a it's definitely a worldwide phenomenon, which is good. Um, you know, Mary, just simply by saying that, you know, people are buying her stuff all around the world. Uh, Bob Murphy's always, you know, my friend, he's going around. Uh, Liberty is infectious. And I was encouraged by the thought that other people were thinking of founding their own parties. I, again, am, am not really enchanted by the political process, but it is pretty exciting. Um, however, our next guest has nothing to do with politics. Yes. But what I think is kind of cool. Uh, and about uh, about Ned from Steemit is that their project sort of democratizes social media to a certain extent. Um, hopefully, at least. Hey, um, this is such a cool project. I'm really excited about it. Well, I really, really hate um, Facebook and I hate Twitter because there's such limited ways of of engaging with people. You know, I could have I have six thousand people that like my Facebook page, and I put a post out, and Facebook only shows it to a hundred people. I'm beginning to come to a point where I literally don't even think, from a business perspective, it's even worth engaging in. I'm really, really angry. Not going to take it anymore. Um, so oh, our next guest. <laughs> Ned is going to help us uh, think about different ways where we could be uh, utilizing social media and our internet tools in order to reach people in hopefully a more organic way. Uh, Ned, thank you uh, for joining us today and welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on. Great. So tell us a little bit about how you got into Bitcoin and what the heck are you doing in it now? 
Great question. Um, yeah, so I guess it was, I was a little late to the game. I got involved in 2013, um, and I was fascinated. I think it, w it was a Yahoo article that I was reading, and, and I was, wow, this, this is really powerful stuff. I turned to my dad, who's a, a Wall Street veteran, and I said, Dad, what do you think of this? He goes, Dad, I, I don't pay attention to the fads. <laughs> and here I am, three years later, you know, still working on this stuff. Um, it's been a long process. You know, there was a lot of going down the rabbit holes and figuring stuff out. Um, but I, I've gotten involved with some really good people. And, and about five months ago, Dan Larimer and I got together to start a blockchain-based social media company called Steemit. So the idea is that uh, we have this decentralized social media platform where people get paid to post and vote and it's as easy to use as pinning the blog post or the video that you've already created. And Tatiana, I think you've been on the site a little bit. It looks it looks like a reddit.com, you know, it's 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 just basically a stream of information of uh, people posting, you know. Why are you guys making it look like Reddit though? Like I hate Reddit. So exactly I think you should like cater Reddit. your project to my okay. specifications. No, I'm just kidding. Well, Seriously, I, why I, are you trying to make it look like Reddit? I feel like Reddit's hard for... I, I mean, people have been telling me to go on Reddit for a really long time. So why is that format what you guys are doing right now? I'm here to torture you. I think that <laughs> we don't... <laughs> well, uh, let's bring you on as a consultant. Sounds like you've got a, good, a good vision for the project. Um, so it's, it's only partially a Reddit.com, thankfully. Mm -hmm. So... It, it, the idea is that you know people are, are being rewarded for curating content so they kinda need a way to absorb and see a lot of the different posts and the reddit formats good for that because you get to see so much on one screen but at the same time it's not exactly the best bloggers platform so you know there's lessons to be learned from medium and from other sites so what we have with steam it is kinda you know just just the first step you know, it's 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 the first interface, but the whole thing we have here is is completely sitting on a blockchain. So Steemit.com is just one application of this blockchain called Steam. Um, other people can come along and launch the same type of business with a different format. So if you don't like the Reddit format, then you know somebody else, some other entrepreneur, will come along and build something on the same database, you know, that appeals more to your taste. So tell me a little bit about uh, this uh, this blockchain. Uh, it's, not a blockchain. It's, not, uh, it's not the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, it's your own blockchain. And uh, uh, how does it scale? How does it store data? Uh, tell us a little bit uh, of the background. And how how do how do content creators get paid? Is that through the mining process? Sorry, that's like three questions in one. But yeah, uh, I'll take a shot at that. If I forget to answer one, let me know. But um, basically. You know, I'm lucky to have a really incredible team. And my, my business partner and CTO is Dan Larimer. Dan has been in the Bitcoin space since 2009. And it was, I think, in 2012, maybe the earliest part of 2013, that he started actually building blockchain technology, really building at the, at the protocol level. And he, he went on a journey, you know, of building, you know, different blockchain solutions. One of them was BitShares, which was a very popular... Uh, platform for you know has been for a long time yeah. and through that process of building BitShares uh, he really came across uh, a lot of in innovations you know in regards to speed and scalability and and he's taken that platform and, and the sort of the sort of tool chest that, that it's built on and and it's tested into the tens of thousands of transactions per second Theoretically, you could take the same technology and, and scale to over 100,000 transactions per second. And that's important for any application that's going to actually become mainstream. You know, if you're talking about, you know, payments, you know, Visa does thousands and thousands of transactions per second. If you're talking about social media platforms, Reddit alone is doing, you know, probably 250 or 500 transactions per second. Not, not payment transactions, but clicks and votes and posts. You know, so yeah. you get even more actions in social media than you do in, you know, a payments business. Um, so the blockchain that, that we built is, you know, we pulled from a lot of different open source projects and we were able to come up with this framework of a blockchain that could actually support the posts and the comments 
and the votes. So everything that happens on Steemit.com sits on the blockchain, no matter how small of an action that is. And, and, and that's powerful because it makes the whole system replicable. And no one owns your data. You know, it, the data is given back to the public. Um, which I think you know kind of leads to your, your your other question about how how are they getting paid? So so the blockchain's reading all the posts and all the votes. It's kind of tallying it all together and saying, okay, here are the best posts, and then it has a certain rewards fund, and it, it sends it distributes the rewards to the best posts on down the line. You know basically, you know the, the only threshold there is the post has to be worth at least you know a few cents worth of the token. The token's called Steam, with mm -hmm. two E's. Um, so you pay that those steam to to post something? Is that correct? Right. So so you get rewarded if the post is appreciated by the community. So if you're getting upvotes, you'll end up getting paid by the blockchain for that. And how do you stop that getting gamed uh, by like uh, people writing programs to vote and sock puppets and all the rest of the stuff we see on Reddit? Oh, absolutely. There, there's people showing up and they're treating this like a game. And they're trying to get every advantage they can. So as we built it, you know, that was something we acknowledged and something that we worked to to level out. We wanted to have a level playing field. You know, we knew it would be a playing field, but if you can make it level and people can understand the rules, then you know everyone has the same you know potential advantages. Um, so part of the way you do that is through stake weighted voting. So you have to prevent civil attacks, prevent people from creating, you know. Uh, in, from getting more voting power, but just by creating more accounts. Yeah. So, so stake weighted voting was big there. There's also rate limiting on your voting. So if you're voting too much too fast, your voting power diminishes. Kind of like in a video game where you have, you know, a certain amount of power or or like magic power, it can diminish as you. I don't know. This is a funny example, but if you cast spells or something like that, your power decreases and then it comes back slowly over time. So that's kind of the same way your voting power works on this platform. Okay, okay. So, wow. So, and, and, and the blockchain is holding all this data? I mean, it, it must be enormous. How, how does that work? It works uh, by the consensus mechanism that we've built in. So this uses a certain proof of work uh, combined with a delegated proof of stake. And because of that, the, the block producers, the nodes, are able to handle the capacity. Uh, over time, you probably wouldn't be able to run this thing on a home computer. Um, but it is decentralized you know, among nodes around the world um, who are willing to scale up to support this thing. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty fast when I use it. Uh, you know, it loads amazingly quick. I, I'm, I'm super impressed. Yeah, yeah. So do some voting, too, because, you know, Every action you take, you know, it's it's about it's three second block times, which is lightning quick. So that's one and a half seconds uh, for an action, you know, on average. Um, so it's real time speed, you know, and that was really important because we knew if we were going to build a consumer application, the blockchain would have to back all this up. There couldn't really be a delay. So when you say the block, uh, the blocks are quick. Does it? Uh, do you have to wait for like? 600 confirmations before you can be sure it's the data secure? Yes, yeah, I mean that's part of it, but but luckily the confirmations are also happening quickly. Um, so so you don't really have to feel like you're waiting. So it's generally the same as Bitcoin, it's a, a, like an hour, which means 60, uh, six confirmations of Bitcoin is considered, right? And, and I guess uh, in, in, in most blockchains, because it's it's all based on on, on uh, hashing algorithms, right? Where you you're trying to get these blocks. Um, the quicker they are, the more uh, the, the less uh, work is needed to crack that one uh, potentially. And so, if you if you have it quicker, you have to wait just as long. So an hour is like the general time. Right. So the way the proof of work in this model works is is basically um, the hashes get you a spot in a in a queue. And then, so you earn your place in the queue, and then when it's time for you to produce a block, that's when you do your proof of work. And because oh. of that that model, we were able to get it much, much faster. That's delegated proof of work, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, fascinating. Um, and so why, why a blockchain? Why not just uh, some other decentralized technology uh, based on, uh, on file storage, different, like, uh, like uh, 
a bit uh, torrid or something like that. Well, well, the really the really unique thing here that that you know we needed from blockchain technologies is, is the cryptocurrency and the, and the and the the incentives you know that you can get from cryptocurrency. So so Bitcoin was was so powerful. You know when you first learned about it, you're hearing yeah you just turn your computer on and you're making money. You know, that was back in 2012, 2013, even earlier, I guess. But with this, it's the same sort of thing. You just go to this site and you post or vote, and suddenly you're making money. You know, so so how does that work? Well, you need this cryptocurrency, right? And the cryptocurrency is supported by the blockchain, right? So this whole network has to be decentralized. I mean, if you can come up with a, you know, a, a cryptocurrency that's not on a blockchain that's also counterparty free, let me know. <laughs> um, but you know that that's basically it. We had to support the economic mechanisms here. The, the, so so what's got, what happens with Bitcoin? You know, it creates new bitcoins to pay the miners to secure the network. That the economic term there is seniorage, right? It's creating new bitcoin and and it's it's essentially an inflation tax, right? So there's something similar going on here, but we're using it to pay people to post and vote, which I think is cool because because now we have this really low barrier to entry for people to come along and, and earn cryptocurrency. You know they're they're already on social media sites around the world posting, you know this that their blog their videos you know and now they can do the same thing, and they can make money from it, and they can do that without using advertising. Have right. you have you taken a look at a uh, Bitlanders project? So that's the project where they're putting land on the Bitcoin blockchain. No, Bitlanders is uh, is pretty similar to what you guys are doing in that people are incentivized to post. They get you know a little micro tip or whatever for every time they're voted up uh, for the more that they're posting. One of the things that I found um, like a little bit hard to get around was if we were going to, for example, sell advertising to those people, it's not very high quality of an audience because you're getting a lot of people in like Indonesia that if they click on something that amount for them is is worth doing it so you're getting almost not spammers but just not people that you would necessarily try and sell an iPhone to because for them it's really hard to you know earn a dollar a day so how do you do you, do you are you concerned about that like do you only want people from America because that sounds kind of messed up now that I'm saying it out loud right? I'm like well we don't want those weirdos from but it's not that it's just that those are not really people that I would consider engaging on a regular level um, that are coming from the same place that have common interests these are just people in a very poor country that are looking for alternative ways of um, digging themselves out of poverty have you thought of anything around that yeah so I think we have to look a little bit more into Bitlanders. Um, so it sounds like it's a it's a it's a platform for tipping, right? No, yeah. it's it's basically like a social media um, thing. You should take a look. They have some they have some really cool things going on. I don't they they've transitioned into slightly different approaches. And um, and to be fair, I really like that team over there. I'm not trying to pit you against each other, but more what I'm trying to find out was that issue that I kept seeing come up in my, in the back of my mind, which was, yeah, but the value of advertising, for example, to somebody who's in the middle of nowhere is not as valuable as getting some chick in New York or some random person in California. So, so, so Tatiana, we don't have advertising. Right. So is so we, there anything that needs to be considered in that regard in terms yeah. of the quality of people engaging? Because somebody could be voting for, uh, you know, and participating in the system in order to be incentivized in some way. Right, they are doing that for some reason. So, what do you but, do? So, so they get rewarded for posting and voting, mm -hmm. and they do that without a middleman. So there's no advertiser influencing mm -hmm. the content, and that's because of the economics built into the cryptocurrency. So I think there's a lot of teams out there solving an incredibly difficult problem. You know, how do we give social media back to the people? And to date, a lot of those platforms you know, have been tipping platforms or revenue sharing platforms where they take revenue from the advertisers and then they redistribute it amongst the posters and perhaps the voters. So Steam bypasses that, has a solution to that in that no one has to tip anyone and advertising revenue doesn't need to be shared to reward the posters and voters. The blockchain itself takes new cryptocurrency to pay these people when they're upvoted. So if I think you have a great post, Tatiana, if you come to Steam it and post something and I upvote you, 
you'll be paid by the blockchain. I don't need You're to not going to get anything for that? So I don't need to I don't need to actually give you anything other than the upvote for you to be rewarded. Right, but aren't you also getting rewarded? So wouldn't that incentivize you to artificially use the platform if you just wanted to make some money? I mean, even right, if right, it's right. not coming from advertisers, you're still so you is that adding value? You have incentivized curation and creation. So so on the curation side, you know, people yes, they're incentivized to vote, but they have limited voting power. Right? Okay. So I want to select the best stuff. So the best stuff rises to the top and makes the platform overall more valuable. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a fantastic concept. I really like it. I think the difference here is that we're to 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 wrap our heads around the fact that something is decentralized and autonomous. That uh, that we have a, a development core team. How are you guys getting paid? So I guess that that's where where we're kind of stuck, right? Is the the old model is advertising. Um, how does uh, yeah, Steam? Right. Steam so it? so over the long run. You know, you can we can implement business models using the site. So one that we'll probably employ, that still gets us around the whole advertising thing, is user promoted content. So if you're a blogger, and you have some really great post, you're thinking to yourself, okay, I need to get this in front of a critical mass of eyeballs, so that that turns into a critical mass of upvotes, and then the cycle continues, and my post goes all the way to the top of the site. And I want to do that because I'll be rewarded for that. So maybe you're you're willing to to pay something to promote your post so that it gets more exposure. So now we have the users, the bloggers, the video creators that are deciding to pay to have their content promoted. Um, so so that's kind of what we foresee happening. It's less third-party advertisers and it's more you know community members promoting their own stuff. Okay, so it is still a type of advertising, though. In a sense, in a sense, it is. Um, well, I mean, over, I don't see anything. Time, here, so, alternatively, over time, you could like we could just be doing this project, you know, out of the goodness of our hearts, and we could end up with a completely native app that you download, yeah. and it runs completely from the completely from the blockchain. It has no ads, no promoted content at all. All we have to do to get to that point is finish. The app, and then the blockchain keeps running, and the then you never need the app. You never need promoted content. Pro no, no programmer can ever finish a, pro a project fully. That's always something. <laughs> but I, you know, I don't mind advertising. You know, people go on about how terrible advertising is. I, I think it's, I think it's a great way to monetize uh, content. It's, it's really, I, I don't, you know, if I don't, you know, if I don't look at it. Yeah, it can corrupt uh, certain content things. Uh, content. Uh, Sites, so for instance, um, you might uh, see an advertiser drop uh, if a certain political view is mentioned or something like that. But uh, this isn't the case with uh, with the model that you guys have here. Right. Yeah, it's it's a model for the community. You know, so so what we think we're building is you know a place where the community doesn't feel like they're being targeted. You know where they feel like they're there to help each other. So, so this idea really, really, you know, blossomed out of the objective to to create a, a blockchain app where people could help each other. You know, we were kind of looking at micro insurance, mutual aid, and we ended up with this model, which I think you know will ultimately accomplish the same thing. People will be on this forum. They'll be able to ask questions. They'll be able to provide valuable answers to one another, and the value comes from people with inside the community helping each other. Do you have any kind of protections in place? Um, what if I wanted to put up, I don't know, crazy child porn, obviously the big boogeyman, right? What happens if somebody starts putting up something that is obviously undesirable and then where do you draw that line? Because some people may say that certain political speech is undesirable. Um, how are you dealing with that? So two things. So, so for one, the community can vote it down. Mm -hmm. And once it gets downvoted all the way, then it pretty much disappears from the site. Okay. But now the other thing is, you know, if the government were to come along and say, you can't show this type of content or that type of content, we could say, okay, we, we won't show it. So the most we can do is hide it. You know, otherwise the government's going to shut us down, right? So we would do it. But the thing is, that content can never be erased from the blockchain itself. 
it's permanently there on a public, transparent, auditable record. And you know, if we were to get too happy, too trigger happy with the whole censorship thing, people could actually point at our business and say, look at all these articles these guys are censoring. They're in the blockchain, but they're not on the site. And if that were to happen, then someone else could come along and launch another business leveraging the same data from the same blockchain with less censorship, and suddenly they'd be more competitive than us. Amazing. Okay. Very uh, cool. How much data, it, it, you know, what sort of, it, are the posts, because I'm, I'm noticing there are some posts that are just linking from other articles that are sitting on a server, um, and some articles are just someone's written some stuff. Um, and I'm guessing that data is in the blockchain, right? Yeah, any text you see, any text you see there is on the blockchain. Phenomenal. And how does it interface to the HTTP protocol? It, um, well, we'd have to actually get Dan on the phone to talk about all the specific technical aspects. Yeah, I think our audience isn't too technical anyway, so we'll just leave that question. There. When we talk about technical stuff, my eyeballs just glaze over. <laughs> I can't so, take it. I mean, what I, I'm excited about is is trying to post some more stuff on there because it was a little thrill that I got when I posted it. I also got the the uh, the helping hand of Ned to to show me how to do it. <laughs> I, I went back. I think I think you had a lot of upvotes on those posts. The, was it all you and Dan? <laughs> Yeah, so so actually when this is over, we gotta take the link to this and we'll post it on the site. I know the community would love to see it. Yeah. Excellent. So um we we gotta wrap it up guys because we're we're up on the hour. Did you have another question, Josh? Because I had some suggestions on how we could uh try it this out. Oh uh, well, I just have one more question. Um do you have analytics on what IP addresses are hitting? Like I'd be interested to see what part of the world are using a service like this, uh, an immutable service, and do you promote it as an immutable service? So we just, re you know, we just launched a few weeks ago. Um, Google Analytics today will show us that we're mostly driving traffic from the U.S. and Europe, um, but we have, you know, we're still in beta, so we haven't completely turned on the burners in terms of marketing. Um, but you know, people who are interested in the concept are showing up, and you know. The movement is slowly growing, and you know we have a number of things in place to attract more people. Um, you know we can we can basically you know, run this big faucet to get people to sign up, um, and there's incentives to come and post and vote. So you know the incentives are there to come and and participate. Um, there's also I want to mention on July 4th the actual first content rewards payout happens. So that's going to be 10% of the total token supply is going to be distributed to the best posts and votes. So at current market cap, so the current market cap is between 17 and 25 million. Um, at 25 million dollars, that's two and a half million dollars of Steam tokens being distributed. So people are coming to the site now, competing for that that initial rewards uh, mm -hmm. allocation. Listen, uh, nobody go to the site. It's overrated. Don't go there. Just show up after July 4th. <laughs> Just some a little friendly advice. <laughs> Oh, that's good. I, I mean, I'm Ned, I'm super impressed here. It's it's. I I I don't think there's any other service that I've seen that's truly decentralized like this. I mean, in terms of on a on a web page that I can just browse with my browser. Right, and so your password. So there's a digital wallet built in there too. The password, the keys, they're all client side. We don't have any of it. It's a lot like a blockchain.info meets one of these social media sites. Um. So when you come check it out, sign up, you know, save your password and all that. Um, I vote that tomorrow morning we do a little walkthrough, me, you, and Josh, and uh, and we'll try posting up this show, which will be, uh, you know, we air on a number of different stations. Let's talk Bitcoin. Adam Levine actually likes your project. Was curious to see how things are moving along, so that'll be fun. Um, but also Liberty.me, of course, is our host. Um, IPM Nation and LRN.FM. So these are all people who are tapped into the space and hopefully they'll all give it a shot. After July 4th, just wait it out, guys. No, I'm just kidding. You can all try it right away. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, tomorrow morning I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a message when we're done here and we'll try and coordinate something and we'll give uh, give some steam a shot. Um, do we have a magic phrase or word today? 
I think I'm gonna guess it. I'm gonna I'm gonna set the tone, and I think that in uh, we're gonna we're gonna make our magic word or phrase "power to the people," because that's what we're talking about. With Mary, Mary is talking about empowering the people. Steam it empowers the people. Save me from my Facebook hell that eats my brain daily, please. <laughs> um, I get so frustrated with it. Um, Ned, where can people check you out? How can people stay in touch? Yeah, come to steamit.com. That's steam it with two e's, s t e e m i t. Uh, you can also come to our Slack. That's steam.herokuapp.com. Uh, just post on Steam it if you can't find the link, or I can send it to you guys. You can publish it. Um, yeah, so so meet us on the site steamit.com, or meet us in the Slack. You know, all the developers are there. There's about 200 early adopters, developers kicking the tires. So also a fun place to be. Very cool. All right. Well, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Bye, everybody. Have a good show. Take care. Oh wait, Josh. Last minute plug for Voltoro. You guys just did something special. I think you did like 50% off of fees or something. Oh yeah, well, well we got our first birthday, so um, we're 25, uh, we're 50% off all trading fees for the 30 days, and um, and uh, in real gold. So if you'd like trading physical assets uh, with your cryptocurrency, we're the only true exchange, true marketplace for gold and Bitcoin. And um, so right now we're the cheapest place in the world and the fastest place because normally to get physical allocated gold takes uh, you know banking old school banking days and five working days, but now it's boom, 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 and you can sell it just as fast for Bitcoin. So super excited. We're getting lots of volume because of it, and uh, and it's uh, I'm just excited that we're around for a year and watching this rev evolution, I'd like to say, because the revolutions are usually violent, and this one is beautifully peaceful. Wonderful. Okay, everybody, please um, come to my website, TatianaMrose.com. We've actually been updating it. It looks semi-normal. I'm very excited. Um, you can also come to CryptoMediaHub.com if you have any advertising, PR, or consulting needs for this beautiful space that we call blockchain now because Bitcoin became a dirty word. Just kidding. Not really. Um. <laughs> it's weird, right. isn't it? uh, can we just quickly mention that? It's just the oddest thing. I'm, I'm so talking, bizarre. It's so bizarre. I'm talking to some investors that like Bitcoin. Oh, no. Oh, blockchain? Oh, yeah, I'm interested. It's like, dude. Are you that dumb? Like, are you that? Stupid? I don't like, think you need to say that to them. <laughs> if they're uh, potentially investing in you, <laughs> no, I don't. I don't take that, uh, that answer me like that. Seriously, I just go. You know what? You can invest in something else because I don't want you. Like honestly, uh, no, seriously. So, like people, if you're that dumb, like honestly, it's like saying I really love poker but I hate playing cards. Like, hello. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway. Um, anyway, all right. Well, also, everybody, please make sure you go to freeross.org. I'm uh, down here with uh, Lynn Albrecht. We are taking over the Libertarian uh, Convention by storm. I'm also here with my good friend Gary Malevsky from Snoopwall. He actually rented a house for us, so I have to give him a plug. Um, and that's it. I'm done plugging. Goodbye, everybody. I love you all. I'll see you soon. Bye. Take care.